Romans chapter 6, verse 14. And it says this in the New King James Version. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. This morning, the good news that I want to share with you is really summarized in one sentence. And that is, the good news, that your God is bigger than your sin. (laughs) That your God is bigger than whatever that cherished habit is that you have been struggling to break in your life. For you are not under law, but you are under grace. Now, I know if, you are, if you've had any exposure to the general Christian world, a good traditional Adventist is rather worried that I keep repeating that phrase. For you are not under law, but under grace. It is probably one of the most misquoted phrases in all of Christendom. It's become one of the favorites to try and tell us that the good news of the gospel is that the Ten Commandment law was nailed to the cross. That the good news of the gospel is that because of what Christ has done, the moral code of God no longer exists. But I would suggest to you that that is not a gospel. That that is condemnation. Now how can I say something like that? Well, if you reason from cause to effect, which often is not the case when this phrase is quoted... And you'll see in a little while, I'll move on to something a little more practical than merely theoretical and theological. But I'd like to follow Paul's example as he gives it to us in Romans and Galatians as elsewhere, where he often starts with some really deep theological reasonings, and then he moves over to practical life application. So just stick with me for a moment and lend me your mind. If you take this idea that you are not under law, but that you're under grace as to mean that the moral code of God's Ten Commandments are nailed to the cross, therefore no longer valid you really do not end up so much with a plan of salvation as with a plan of condemnation. How is that so? Well, if you reason from cause to effect, as I was saying, which in most cases, it's not done. We just use the phrase because on the surface of it, it sounds great. You are not under law. You are under grace. So the law is gone because an age of grace is coming. In the Old Testament times, poor them, too bad if you were born during the first 4,000 years of Earth's history, Because you would have had to have been good enough for God to accept you into heaven. You would have had to keep his law by your own strength, and that's how you were saved. But praise God, we've been born during the last 2,000 years of earth's history, in which a dispensation of grace has come in. So you are not like those poor suckers born in the Old Testament times, being under law, but you are liberated from the law, and you are now under grace. The problem with that? is that then we end up with universal salvation. You end up with a situation where if Christ, death on the cross, did away with the law, everyone's going to heaven. Because then there is no such thing as sin anymore. And if there is no such thing as sin, then there cannot be condemnation. And if, they can, if there's no condemnation, then there is no need for a savior. And the whole theory really kind of implodes on itself. But I start off by saying it's really a gospel of condemnation. How do I get to that? Because the other line of reasoning is also true. That if that is true, that grace simply does away with the law, as it were, it would legitimize you in your sin. So grace becomes the license for sin instead of the cure to sin. Grace becomes the means to allow you to escape the consequences of condemnation while at the same time allowing you to continue in the same old ways you've always been living. So why give up the drugs? So why give up the adultery? So why give up all that stuff? Because grace means that the consequences are removed and the law of God is removed. And so it becomes a way of legitimizing sin. It becomes a license for sin. So on the one hand, everybody gets to heaven. On the other hand, it's a gospel of condemnation. Because I don't know about you, but if heaven is more of what we have down here, you can keep it. (laughs) Not interested. I want to escape from this place of brokenness. I don't want to go to a place where simply it's legitimized, it's excused, and the consequences are removed, so we'll go on like we are, except without death. Not a good place to be. 
For you're not under law, but under grace. <clears throat> cannot mean that. It just cannot mean that. You can only take that meaning if you have not read the rest of Scripture. Hey, if you've not read the verse after this, or if you've not read the sentence before it, or if you've not read the end of chapter 3. If you go back to Romans chapter 1, and just trace Paul's arguments so that we can put this verse in its right context. In Romans 1, he speaks to the Gentile world. In Romans 1, he declares a part of his message which the Jew would have had no problem in accepting. The Jew would have read Romans chapter 1, and immediately the sense of pride and self-sufficiency would have come up. Because essentially what Paul does is he places every Gentile, and what is a Gentile? A Gentile is anyone who's not of Jewish origin, right? Not of Israelite origin. That basically means probably everyone in this church. Maybe, is there anyone here with a Jewish mother? Okay, so you're all Gentiles, right? Every single one of us, the Israelite would have been very glad to read chapter 1 because it condemns every single one of us. It says that it does not matter whether you were born with a knowledge of the law, the Torah, the, the, the scriptures of the Old Testament, it does not matter whether you were born with that knowledge or not, like the Gentile is not. They're not accustomed to this law. You know this even in uh, secular New Zealand today, right? There are people growing up in this country who wouldn't be able to know Genesis from Revelation. And Paul comes along and he says, it does not matter whether they've, whether they've known the scriptures or not, all are condemned. Because even in nature, we have testament to the fact of intelligent design, despite what the evolutionists will try and tell you. Paul says, even in nature, we have a testament to the love and the mercy of God. Yes, it's a marred testament. It is not a perfect testament because sin has ruined nature. And there are some uh, uh, descriptors of the concept of the great controversy. But even in nature, the observant Gentile can discern that there must be something greater than humanity. There must be something from whence all that can be seen came from. And so even the Gentile has the law of conscience, as the Holy Spirit is not restricted only to work with those who have a knowledge of the Scriptures, but the Holy Spirit brings conviction even to the Gentile mind, using the things of nature, speaking directly to the conscience, so that even if they don't have the finer details of salvation and the finer details of morality, in a general tendency, their, their, their heart's direction can be determined in how they relate to the Holy Spirit's leading. Do they live up to the light that the Holy Spirit impresses upon their minds? Surely a Gentile can know that murder is wrong, that lying is wrong, because the Holy Spirit brings that conviction to their hearts. They choose in their daily life whether they will yield to that conviction or not. And so all are without excuse before God, whether you've had the Scriptures or you haven't had the Scriptures. Chapters 2 and 3, of course, is where the Israelite would have gotten a little bit of antsy and a bit nervous because uh, he starts to speak about the Jewish nation. And he actually places the Hebrew nation under greater condemnation than the Gentile. Now, that would have been the problem. <laughs> because if you were of Hebrew origin, you were born saved. I mean, you were the chosen nation. You were on the right track. You were headed to heaven by virtue of your biological family tree. And now he comes along and he says, the Gentile is condemned. He is without excuse. The Jew goes, yes, sir. And then he goes, but you are more condemned. And they go, no, sir. How can that be? And he says, you have had greater light than they. They have had the spirit convicting their minds. They have had the testament of nature to which both of those you have also had plus the word of God. Plus the finer details of salvation. Plus the finer details of morality. And you have not lived up to the light that you have received. In as much as you claim to be the chosen people, you are under so much under greater condemnation. For to be chosen means to have had greater privileges than the unchosen. And therefore you are not better off, you are worse off. For you have not lived up to what it means to be chosen. You have not lived up to the oracles of God. Paul makes a very clear point here in the first two chapters. Before he can even begin to talk about how you are saved... He has to get his reader, whether Gentile or Jew, to realize that they need a Savior. Because as the, as the Hebrew mind would be reading, they would be thinking, I don't really need this Jesus. I don't really need this Savior. I have the law. As Paul says, born on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, 
a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee climbing the ladder of success. I had it all. If anyone was going to heaven, it was me. And then one day I met Christ. And I realized that all my righteousness fell far short of his righteousness. I was good relative to other people. But I was bad and rotten relative to Christ. And so he starts off, he says, before you can even understand the gift of heaven in the person of Christ, Jew and Gentile, Seventh-day Adventist and secularist, you must understand something. You are bankrupt, deserving of condemnation and death. For there is no one in this world who has not fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans chapter 3, he outlines faith through Christ. He speaks about how Christ is this big word here in verse 25 of chapter 3. A propitiation. What's that? An atoning sacrifice. That it is through his sacrifice that we are made right with God. He moves from the condemnation of the Gentile and the condemnation of the Jew over to describing how though they are both condemned, they can both be saved by the same means, by the same being, through Christ and what he's accomplished. And then at the end of chapter 3, he anticipates what the Hebrew mind is going to jump to next. He anticipates that the Hebrew mind is going to rebel against this because of what the Gentile mind is going to interpret by this, if you follow the logic, and that is that if you are saved by grace through faith, then the law is irrelevant. And so at the end of chapter 3, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? You know, is law and faith opposites? Were you saved by law one time and saved by faith another time? Is if, if you have the one, do you, do you need the other or not? It says, do we make void the law through faith? Because I have found faith in Christ, do I throw the, the law out now and say, I don't need it anymore. It's gone. It's finished. No longer relevant to the 21st century. And what's his answer? Certainly not. In the old King James, you may have it in even, even stronger language. It may say, God forbid. On the contrary, he says, we establish the law. Faith establishes the law. How is that possible? Very simply. Because in order to have faith in Christ, you have to accept the condemnation of the law. <laughs> Which means that there is a law, right? How can you be condemned by something that no longer exists? So to have faith in Christ as a prerequisite, you have to recognize that you are condemned. And the instrument that condemns you is the written in stone moral code of the righteousness of God. The revelation of who God is as he pins it down in stone with his own finger. And he says, this is my character. And this is what I expect of you. For if we're going to walk together, we have to be agreed. And when we read the transcript of his character, when we have a look at what he reveals about himself and what he expects of us, we go, oh, God, have mercy. For I am condemned. I cannot live up to that. I have never lived up to that. I am broken. I am sinful. I fall short of your glory. So faith establishes the law. It does not destroy the law. Because before I have faith, I have to reach the point where I am condemned. And you are condemned by the law. Faith establishes the law. True faith. So how is it after those chapters in, in the book of Romans, in the Christian world today, we take half a sentence from a short verse and we teach a whole theology that is contrary to the rest of Scripture? Oh, for you are not under law, but you're under grace. The good news of the gospel is that the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross through the grace of Christ. Don't worry about them. doesn't make sense does it now let's come back to Romans chapter 6 in Romans chapter 6 verse 15 Paul again just like at the end of Romans 3 anticipates a misunderstanding of what he says so he asks a question what then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace shall we continue to live the same old broken ways that we used to live before we came to Christ, before we discovered the grace of Christ, are we now free to carry on living that way? 
Shall we, conti shall we continue in sin? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And he answers with exactly the same phrase as in Romans chapter 3 verse 31. God forbid. Certainly not. He says, whatever you understand by not under law but under grace, what it does not mean is that you are free to go back to your old immoral ways. Grace is not the license to sin. Grace is not the legitimizing of your sin. Grace is not the means by which God saves you in your same old sinful lives. Grace is a power for salvation from sin. Go back to the first sentence of, chapter, of verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Now, there's two words we must understand here. And when you get these two words in conjunction with one another sorted out, you will know you don't even have to read verse 15 because the first half of verse 14 tells you that the last half of verse 14 cannot mean what it is taught to mean. <laughs> Did you follow that? So let's have a look here. The first one is sin. Any good Adventists here that can give me a definition of sin? Transgression of the law, right? Where is it found? 1 John 3 verse 4. Sin is lawlessness. For sin is the transgression of the law, and sin is lawlessness. Being without law. You know a fancy English word for that? Autonomy. Autonomy. When I was growing up as a teenager... I believe that the definition of freedom was autonomy. It comes from two Greek words, auto and nomos. Nomos being law, auto, the person, being a law unto themselves. Autonomy. Being a law unto themselves. Not answering to mom and dad, not answering to the teachers, not answering to the police, not answering to no one, anytime, anywhere. That is freedom. That's what I grew up believing. And I lived my life in harmony with that philosophy. I hated all authority. My parents, God, pastors, teachers, all of them. Because they all had something to say about the way I was living. And it wasn't in praise. It was corrective. That's not freedom. I didn't want to wear school uniforms. You know, in South Africa, I don't know about you so much, but in South Africa, we have the strong British tradition, uniforms. I didn't want to have my hair cut at school. I wanted it to be long. I didn't want anyone to tell me I couldn't have body piercings everywhere. Still got some of them. I wanted to be a law unto myself. I didn't want anyone to tell me I couldn't treat the body, my body, the way I wanted to treat it, which was generally to get the most pleasure out of life. So if that was through illicit sex or through drugs or through rock and roll or through whatever it was, don't tell me because it's my body. And the definition of freedom is being a law unto myself. I want to do whatever, wherever, however, with whomever. It's very interesting because Alistair Crowley, one of the top leaders of the satanic movement of our modern day and age, formulated a phrase which describes Satan's definition of freedom. And this is what Aleister Crowley, and by the way, he was really, from a spiritual perspective, one of the inventors of rock and roll music. It was Aleister Crowley who said, he will take magic, as in black magic, as in the occult, white and black is the same, but anyway, he will take magic, combine it with music, and a new era would be born. It was born in the form of the rock and roll industry. Alistair Crowley is a significant leader in the satanic movement, or was. And he was the one who said, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Now, I didn't even know that as a kid. But I was being infused by the spirit of Satan. My definition of freedom was autonomy which is, Alistair Crowley put it so succinctly, do what you want will be the whole of the law. Do what feels good. Do what pleases you. 
Don't worry about anyone else. Don't worry about anything out there. If you want to do it and it feels good and it feels right, that is the whole of the law. Be true to self. Live out your desires. Don't worry about anything else. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That is the principle of Satanism. Now listen, you don't have to sacrifice cats and go to satanic church and stuff to be a Satanist. All you have to do is participate in the Spirit. Hey, you could be a Seventh-day Adventist Satanist. Yeah. You could be coming to church on the Seventh-day Sabbath, saying all the right things, quoting all the right scriptures. But if your ultimate philosophy in life is that of the satanic movement, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, then who are you following, Christ or Satan? Satan. We have too many Satanists amongst us. And isn't it amazing that the Christian world is teaching satanic doctrine? For you are not under law, but under grace. Grace becomes their means of legitimizing the phrase of Alistair Crowley's, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Is that what grace is about? Not if you're a follower of Christ. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is being autonomous. Not, wondering, not, not being interested in what pleases God or how to benefit others, but do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I discovered after a few years of following uh, that philosophy that actually freedom is not autonomy. True freedom only comes from one place, and that's submission to Christ and his precepts. It sounds weird. It, it just, you know, from a logical perspective, it doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously, freedom must mean not having to answer to anyone, doing whatever you want. And that's logical. And I discovered when I lived out that principle of life, I ended up on a mountainside somewhere ready to die. I ended up with suicidal tendencies. I ended up without being fulfilled. I was doing everything I wanted to do. I told my parents to get lost. I told God to get lost. I told the church to get lost. And the further I went down this autonomous road, Doing my own thing. I mean, if I wanted to do it, I did it. If I wanted to buy it, I'd buy it. If I wanted to get high, I'd get high. If I wanted to have sex, I'd have sex. Whatever I wanted to do, I was doing. But it was destroying me. It wasn't fulfilling me. I mean, how is that possible? And the longer I went in that, that, down that road, the more difficult it became to break free of those patterns of doing and being. It was like I became a slave to them. After a while, it was killing me. I could see it was killing me. It was killing me spiritually. It was killing me physically. It was killing me emotionally. There came a point where I wanted to change, where I wanted out. You think I could get out? I wasn't free. I was a slave. Young person, listen to me carefully. If you think for a moment that that's the life, they're living out there. That's the path of freedom. Because on Friday nights, they're free to do whatever they want. And on Sabbaths, they go wherever and they do whatever. And you know, the rest of the week, hey, if they want to drink, they drink. If they want to get high, they get high. If they want to have sex with each other, they have sex with each other. They want to beat the daylights out of someone, they beat the daylights out of each other. I mean, that's freedom, right? I mean, just being able to come and go and do as you please. That's what the devil wants you to think. That's not freedom. That is slavery. Slavery. And by the way, it's why the world is the way it is. The great controversy boils down, if I were to put it into modern language, over this issue. In our world today, two principles are being worked out. This definition of freedom, of autonomy, do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. And isn't that why in New Zealand, increasingly, you're having to lock your doors? One day, by the way, you will be installing burglar bars. Because my country's already a little further down that road. One day, you will no longer have open patches between you and your neighbor. You will be putting up walls. And you'll be putting electric fencing on it. You may be a few years behind. 
But the generation that is coming up in New Zealand now, a godless generation, is building its philosophies on the satanic doctrine of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I've been watching your news. It's not that far off of South Africa's actually. You have it a little less frequently. But the same stuff is starting to happen here. Do not be deceived, friends. Two principles in this world are working themselves out. The law of autonomy, which the devil is trying to sell as the true definition of freedom. And then the law, on the other hand, which is submission to Christ and his precepts, which on the surface of it doesn't look like freedom because he sort of, you know, has got these standards of living. <laughs> This right and wrong idea, this old-fashioned, some things are right and some things are wrong. And how can that be freedom? Because when we all live by that law, you will not need to lock your house. Fear for your young children's safety. You will not have to be at home by a certain time of night for fear of the gangs that roam the streets. Freedom is not autonomy. Freedom is found only and exclusively in the concept of submission to Christ and his precepts, his teachings. So sin shall not have dominion over you. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is this definition of freedom as autonomy. Doing what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Let me replace the word sin with its definition. For transgression of the law shall not have dominion over you. What's dominion? Ownership takes us back to the Garden of Eden, where when we were created in the image of God, what did God give us as part of being in His image? Dominionship, right? They'll have dominion over the earth, over the birds of the sky, over the sea creatures, over everything. Just as God in His sphere is owner, ruler, manager, director of the universe, the beings he created in his image, he gave dominionship to. He shared his authority with them, and they, us, we would rule our little sphere, planet Earth, like he rules the universe. And we would do so in subjection to him and his principles, which would make the Earth a free place. But Adam and Eve stuffed it up. Right? Adam and Eve chose a different principle. Adam and Eve rejected the idea of freedom as submission to Christ and adopted the satanic version in the Garden of Eden that do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You like the fruit? Eat it. Looks so good, right? Go with your feelings. Go with your passions. Go with what the senses tell you. Surely anything that looks this good, feels this good, and believe me, tastes this good, can't be wrong. Hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure as the highest ideal in life. That, by the way, is what the 21st century is all about. Instant gratification is not quick enough. So they buy into it. And the whole of planet Earth is plunged into misery and chaos. Now, I don't know about you, but as a young person or as a young Christian, I really wrestled with this. I didn't understand this. You know, I wasn't there in the Garden of Eden. I mean, Adam and Eve messed up. They should have died. But why us? I mean, what? you know, I wasn't there. How fair is that? If you have a grandpa who's a millionaire, absolutely stinking, filthy rich, you know he's written you into his uh, will as the sole heir of his fortune. You're excited, right? I mean, you don't want him to die, but you kind of do, <laughs> you know. Because you're going to be stinking rich the day he dies, right? So you bide your time, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Finally, the day comes, he dies. Bury him, give him a great funeral, because you know what's coming. After the funeral, you go to the lawyer's office. Time for the reading of the will. And there it is in the will. To my only grandson, I bequeath all that I own. And you go, yes. Sorry you're dead, Grandpa, but yes. I'm rich. And then he takes out the chartered accountant's ledger. 
And to your horror, you discover that in the last five years of his life, he developed a gambling addiction. And he gambled every cent away. It's gone. The will states that he leaves everything to you. But he gave it away before he died. It does not matter what the will says. If he doesn't have it, he cannot give it. Does that make sense? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had the million bucks in their pocket. They had the reward of eternal life. They were born that way. They were created that way. They were designed for that. Never-ending friendships. That's why at funerals you and I cry our eyes out. Because something inside of us tells us these relationships were not supposed to end. We were designed for eternity. They had it. It was written into the world through the genetic code that every child they would have would receive what what God had given them as their inheritance, eternal life. But at the Garden of Eden, at that slot machine known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they put that eternal life into the coin taker. They rang it and they lost. It was gone. They gave it away. And when they died or when they had children and they passed on the genetic code to them, they could only pass on what they had, which was sin, corruption, a bias towards evil, a love for that which is unholy, and the consequences thereof, which is death. That's why you and I suffer on account of Adam and Eve. Because you and I were designed as a social network. And they could only give us what they themselves had, which was corruption. And death. And so the ones who had dominion, created in the image of God, and were given dominion like their father of heaven, became now not the bosses, not the masters, but themselves subjects to the master of sin. The image of God was distorted. No longer were they in charge of themselves and the planet. They sold their freedom and became subject to the dominionship of sin. So that every generation thereafter would naturally have a tendency, a leniency, a bias towards evil. You do not have to treat your children or teach your children how to be naughty. Right? You have to teach them the whole of your life how to be good. Because it is built into our natures to rebel. That's why Proverbs says it takes conscious effort. It says train up a child. Not the modern parenting idea of just, you know, free spirit, let them find their way. All roads eventually lead to heaven. Wrong. You let them follow their human nature and they will deepen. And they will strengthen those sinful tendencies. So Proverbs says it takes some deliberate, intentional, parental uh, um, effort to train up a child in the way that he or she should go. Because you're fighting the natural inborn tendencies of the human nature. So the first half of this verse says, For sin, for the transgression of the law, will not have dominion over you. You see, when you were born, it had dominion. You were its subject. From the day you were born, you were powerless. You were condemned. From the first moment of vague consciousness, you were thinking only and entirely of yourself. But something happened, Paul says. Something happened. And it's described in the first half of chapter 6. You've met Christ... You've come into contact with a being outside of yourself who does for you what you cannot do. Your human nature cannot correct itself. It's powerless. It's impotent. But you meet someone who does have the power. His name is Jesus Christ. He begins working in your life. And the end result is what? That the sin, this transgression of the law, this philosophy of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, that you were powerless to fight against because you were its subject, you were under the dominionship of this philosophy. You couldn't break its way of acting and thinking and doing and speaking. All of a sudden, its power has been broken. You see, because it doesn't say that you shall continue like that. 
It says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. In other words, the good news of the gospel is that there is a power outside of yourself that doesn't just leave you the way you are and help you to escape the consequences. But the grace that forgives and eliminates the consequences is the same grace that transforms and gives power. It's not two different graces. It's one and the same. If you've truly received the forgiveness of God, then you've also received the power of His Spirit. And the power of His Spirit is more powerful than your bent and bias towards evil. He's more powerful than your long-standing, habitual, can't-break-them type of habits. What you cannot do for yourself, He's able to do for you. That's why we call it salvation. He's able to save you. Not just stand on the edge of the pool while you're drowning and going, don't worry, I'll forgive you. Still drowning. But uh, don't worry, once you're dead, uh, you'll get to heaven. You know? If you are drowning, you want someone to get in the pool and get you out, right? You are not saved until you're out of the pool. That's what salvation is. And that's what Christ has done for us. He's done it through the act of grace. You were drowning in your pool. He jumps in. And he doesn't just go, don't worry, you'll escape the consequences. Ultimately, one day, in the future, he jumps in here and now. And he pulls you out of the pool now. And he gives you the assurance of eternal life. That's what salvation is. So sin, here and now, the transgression of the law, here and now, will no longer be your boss, will no longer be your master. Its power has been broken because you are no longer under law, but you are under grace. That phrase, under law, no longer under law, but under grace, is not like the Christian world teaches a statement about, about, uh, about the doing away of the law. It's a statement about the agency of power in your life. In other words, you are not under the law. Struggling to obey God in your own strength, failing, condemned. You've been delivered from that state of helplessness, of being under the condemnation of the law because you are without power and without grace. You've been delivered. You're no longer under the condemnation of the law, but you are now under grace. And grace is a living, real power. So that right here and now today, friends, not one day when Jesus comes, I'll finally be free. But today, there is power to break the sinful habits and tendencies. We call it in fancy language, sanctification. It's not just about forgiveness. As great as that is by itself, I'm not belittling that in any way, by the way. But it's so much more than that. He does it not by dropping his standards and saying, oh, well, bet you can't keep the law. Let me just chuck the whole lot out. He says, I've got something better. The standard will be the same. The same law that condemned you is still in force. But you know what I'm going to do for you? Despite your weakness, despite your frailty, despite your helplessness, despite your human inborn nature of defiance and rebellion, if you will submit to me and give your life to me, I will show you that through my strength, i.e. grace... A change will take place in your daily life. So that whereas you were once led around like a bull with a ring through its nose being pulled. Help, helpless and powerless to break free of the power of sin. I will make you free. Here and now. Today. Friends, that is the gospel message. Without that, there is no good news. Because you are still the same old person in your same old helpless situation, looking forward one day to a better life. The good news of the gospel is it starts now. Christ gives you his grace so that what you could not do in your own strength, he does in you and through you and for you. That law which once condemned you, you are brought back into harmony with it. You do not lower the standard to meet your sinfulness, but he raises the nature, the human nature in you through his grace so that you are able to meet his standard. 
and it is all his work. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8. Have you ever wondered what that means, by grace you have been saved through faith? Connected with this verse? Let me illustrate it to you this way. The girls like this illustration. Guys, you come home from work. It's been a rough day. Boss has been on your case. Traffic in Fungare was unbelievable. And so it's been a rough day. You arrive home. You're in a foul mood. Your loving wife has been at home all day. Man, that house is spick and span clean. Now, this is not a statement on women's roles and stuff. Just forget about that stuff, all right? Just an illustration. So you arrive home and your wife has the place spotless. You can smell not only supper or tea, as you call it, but dessert. But you walk in the door and you are in a foul mood. Your good wife, that saintly woman, that has had to put up with you from the day she said I do, is standing at the door ready to give you a hug. Because all day she has been sorting this place out because this is home and she wants you to come back to a place which you love to be at. And now finally, the object of her affection, that's you guys, has arrived. Man, she's excited inside to see her husband who she's missed all day. Your mind is still in the office. Your mind is still the idiot that cuts you off in traffic. And so as you come in the door, and she kind of has this big smile on her face and throws her arms around you, you give that grunt and kind of almost push her away. Now, girls, ladies, at this point in time, having had your affections spurned like that, what would you say the man deserves and has earned? Don't be shy now. Let the old nature come out. What does he deserve? That's a diplomatic way of saying a good old slap. Anti-smacking law, by the way, is only for kids, eh? Yeah. He deserves a good old smack, right? That's what he's earned. It's the wages of his sin. But being the intuitive, Christian, born again, spirit-controlled woman that you are, you give him some space, you give him some room, and about 10 minutes later, you go into the study where he is, you put your arms around him from behind, and you say, honey, tell me what's on your mind. Perfect marriage, right? What do we call that? Grace. You deserved a smack. What did you get? Love. Love right? But now listen, this is a, a relationship which involves more than one party and alienation has taken place. So in order for the relationship to be healed, in order for reconciliation to take place, you need more than one party to play the game, right? Have you ever had a fight with someone like a situation like this? And you've tried your best, you've apologized, you've stood on your head, you've bought presents, you've done everything, but they will not forgive. Is the relationship healed? No. The relationship is still broken. So grace has been shown. The embrace has been offered. But in order for the reconciliation and healing to take place, there must be the same response. It has to be reciprocated in the same manner. So the husband has to get up out of that old chair, put his arms around his wife who's embracing him, and say, I'm sorry. Right, guys? Don't like that, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> then healing has taken place. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have broken the law and bought into the satanic principle of do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It is inbred into us. It is natural. It is how we are. But we meet Christ one day. He's on the cross. His arms are nailed open in the embrace of grace. He's inviting the world with his arms open. It's not, an in, it's not an exclusive posture. It's a wide open. For you have sinned. You deserve a slap through your face. You deserve the consequences, which is death. But I'm nailed to the cross with my arms wide open. Grace is embracing the world. But you need more than the grace of God for salvation. You need a reciprocation on the part of the individual. For God so loved the world... 
that he gave his only begotten son. But if anybody wants to be saved, whoever believes. For God so loved the world, but whoever. Do you get the picture? He's offered the grace to the world. His arms are nailed to the cross, open in the embrace of grace. For everyone, in every place, the price was paid. No one is without excuse. No one can say, oh, we ran out of grace before I could accept it. But... In order for the reconciliation to take place, the one who is offended must turn around and embrace him back. That is called faith. As to embrace him back and say, what you have done, I accept. What you have done was not just for the world in general, but it was for me in person. And I am sorry for being the sinner that I am. I'm sorry and I turn from it and I embrace you with faith. Only then does reconciliation take place. Only then does salvation take place. For you are saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For you are not under law anymore. You are under grace. The grace of Christ at the cross, which embraces you, which you by faith have embraced in return, is the grace that not only forgives you, but brings power into your daily life. So that the standard of God's righteousness does not need to be lowered to meet your sinful condition, but that you are empowered to rise up from where you are, up from the pit in which you are drowning, and He lifts you up so that you can meet His standard. And it's not done in your own strength. It's done by His grace. So I end where I start. The good news this morning, friends, is that our God is bigger than your sin. Our God is bigger than your addiction. Our God is bigger than your sinful tendencies. Our God is bigger than your cherished sin. That one which you think, I cannot beat this one, I cannot. Who's bigger, your God or your sin? For you are not under law anymore. You are not under the helplessness of human nature trying to save itself through the keeping of the law. You are under grace, which is the power in your life. The grace of God by which the worlds were created, by the power of His word. By His grace you are saved. Is there anything that he cannot change in your life? And the answer to that is, no, there is not. For you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. Please stand. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the self the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath healing cleansing blood Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and all Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more yes tis sweet to trust 
in Jesus, just from sin and self to see, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad to learn to trust Him, precious Jesus. Savior friend, and I know that thou art with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh. God, we need your grace. We need your power. And it is simply our prayer this morning, Lord, that as we go from this place, as we go into a new week in a few hours' time, that this grace, this real, everyday life experience, a practical reality of grace will be ours. Not just the word, not just the theoretical concept, but that we will know the power of God through your grace that will change and transform, give us joy and fulfillment and peace. For we pray it in Jesus' name.